Good morning. Welcome to our third episode of Ohio Bird's Eye. Um, I'm Alyssa Yapel, and I will be helping today with our Q&A. So please utilize your Q&A box um, to ask us any questions or if you just want to say hi and let us know where you're from. We love to hear from you. Um, I'm here today with my friends from our division of Parks and Watercraft, and we're going to talk about hummingbirds. Um, next week, uh, don't miss us. Also, Wednesdays at 10, we'll be talking about cavity nesting birds. But with that being said, I'm going to introduce my coworker, Jenna, and uh, then we'll kind of go down the line um, to Kaylin and then and John um, and get the presentation started. So, Jenna. Hi there, good morning. I'm Jenna Winters. I'm the Naturalist Program Manager for um, Division of Parks and Watercraft, ODNR. Um, I'm like Alyssa, I'm one of the behind the scenes people, so I will be here um, answering your questions. So please feel free. Kaylin, you're up. Hi everyone, I'm Kaylin Counter. I'm the Naturalist at Lake Hope State Park. Mm -hmm. I'll be talking a little bit about gardening for hummingbirds and uh, how to keep those feeders clean and full. Last but not least, uh, we're on to you, John. There you go. Hi, everyone. Uh, Naturalist John from Salt Fork State Park here. Um, and I will be talking a little bit about the natural history of the hummingbird, uh, their migration and morphology, um, and things like that. You can just go on with your presentation, John. I can go on? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, can I go ahead and throw that um, <clears throat> slide that I have up um, um, while I talk or? Yeah, go ahead. You'll just click share and then click the presentation. I don't see it there yet, but we'll get okay. that up in a second. All right. <clears throat> there we uh, go. Can you see it? It's coming in just <clears throat> a second. Sorry, it's taken a second to load. That is all right. I'm sorry. OK, there we go. And good. Yep, just go into presentation mode and you'll be good. All right. All right, good. Um, so, yeah, there we go. Excellent. <clears throat> All right, so uh, hummingbirds, um, there are uh, somewhere around 300 species um, worldwide, uh, which I guess is kind of, uh, kind of a misrepresentation. Really, there's 300 species in the, and that's mostly in the Western Hemisphere. Um, <clears throat> uh, many of those are in South America and Central America. Um, they're, they're uh, Fewer than two dozen that spend um, much time in North America and Canada, and uh, even fewer than that spend uh, the whole year here. Uh, most of them migrate north for breeding purposes, um, <clears throat> and uh, and they uh, now hummingbirds. That diversity. I said there's 300 species. That diversity is really interesting. Uh, hummingbirds are kind of these. Uh, they had this sort of evolutionary explosion where they diverged from uh, a common ancestor. Um, their nearest living ancestor uh, right now is the swift. Um, and somewhere around 42 million years ago, they diverged from a common ancestor in Eurasia. Uh, so actually an old world species. And so I think the earliest hummingbird fossil has been found in Germany. So uh, they migrated this direction uh, as they were evolving, but they uh, diversified very quickly and um, filled a variety of habitats. Now their their evolution seemed to have uh, seemed to seem to stop uh, at a certain point, or at least slow down dramatically, um, probably because of uh, very, they fill a very specialized niche being nectar feeders, feeding on flowers um, and drinking nectar. And so the, there's not a whole lot of room for, uh, 
further adaptation. They kind of found something that works and they're sticking with it. Um, but during that, somewhere around 22 million years of evolution, uh, they really kind of exploded in diversity. So you get a lot of different uh, forms of hummingbirds within those 300 species that are in the, uh, in the New World and in uh, the Western Hemisphere. Um, now, here in the eastern part of the U.S., that's east of the Mississippi, and specifically the northeast where we're at now, like Ohio, um, in this area, we really, the uh, ruby-throated hummingbird is basically the, uh, the only one um, that spends much time. However, the, the black-chinned hummingbird uh, has been seen more frequently as a vagrant, one that gets blown in on weather patterns um, from the Midwest. Uh, so occasionally people will get them in Ohio. I think a couple of times a year they get reported um, in this part of the country. But what we're focusing on today is the ruby-throated hummingbird. Um, <clears throat> they, uh, they begin their migration from Central America in, uh, in February and March, and they fly north across the Gulf Coast, uh, kind of the first wave hitting the Gulf Coast in, uh, <clears throat> in late March, early April. <clears throat> Sorry, um, and uh, they, uh, they, sorry, kind of lost my place here. Um, and then they move, they make their way north kind of as, uh, as the plants that they are, um, <clears throat> they are feeding on are blooming. You can kind of track the, uh, the bloom reports from the south. You can kind of track hummingbird migration north. Uh, they sort of follow those, those plants. Uh, that way they have plenty to to eat. Um, now, hum ruby-throated hummingbirds are characterized by, uh, first of all, they're named for that beautiful red gorget, that throat uh, that the males have. Um, that's uh, kind of typical about, uh, with bird morphology, is the males uh, tend to be the flamboyant ones to attract the females, uh, while the females, they're also beautiful. They've got that emerald green iridescent back, uh, they lack that gorget. They have a, kind of a mottled gorget that isn't as uh, isn't as stunning and bright as the males. And the juveniles um, kind of a drab. The juvenile uh, non-breeding hummingbirds are kind of a drab uh, with some iridescence. Um, you can see in the upper left-hand illustration of the hummingbirds. There is in the, the central picture. There is an immature hummingbird. Uh, doesn't quite have that iridescent. Um, sheen to it that the male and the female has. Um, now they're uh, they're really interesting as a whole. The uh, the hummingbird the that that the whole uh, group of hummingbirds they're kind of interesting. As I said, they're they're only living descendant right now. Their closest relative is the swift, and their whole order the whole order that includes swifts and hummingbirds. Uh, the, the actual Latin name for that means no feet. People uh, saw them, they move so quickly and so rapidly and so often that uh, it was theorized by early naturalists that they, uh, they actually didn't have feet, that they spent their entire life in the air moving all the time. Uh, that's not the case. If you have hummingbird feeders at home, obviously you've seen hummingbirds perch on them. Um, so we know that they, you know, we know that they have feet, but their, their order is still named uh, that and I bring this up because it illustrates just how rapidly these animals move. You know, it's not like a, uh, well, it's not like a raptor per se, where you can watch a, you know, if you watch a red-tailed hawk on a power line in the winter while it's snowing, sometimes they can have, you know, an inch of snow pile up on them while they're just sitting there. Hummingbirds are constantly moving, um, and with they have this extremely high metabolism and uh, an extremely higher heart rate. You know, up to uh, 1,200 beats. Uh, per minute, which is uh, just fantastic as far as heart rates go. Uh, it's in, in, insane. Uh, they can take 250 breaths per minute. Um, and their wing beats, uh, and this has always astonished me every time I think of this, it's kind of mind boggling. Their wing beats, uh, if you can picture it, I mean, they're a blur, but 80 beats per second, that's a lot of, that. I mean, that is a lot of motion. And they're not flapping their wings like an owl or a robin. They're actually moving 
their wings in these sort of horizontal figure eight motions to say to, to hover, to, to uh, um, suspend themselves in the air like they do. And uh, now they the moments of rest that they have, they can actually slow down. They go into what is called torpor, where they're actually slowing down all of their bodily functions um, to rest. So they're not using energy. Uh, they kind of go into sort of a stasis. That torpor allows them not to uh, not to keep burning calories all the time. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, during migration, which this is interesting, so hummingbirds, their size, uh, then there are a lot of different ways to illustrate their size. Um, but their their size is, uh, I mean, they they weigh roughly as much as a penny. You know, um, males tend to be slightly smaller than females being somewhere between, uh, it's usually somewhere around three to 3.5 grams and the heaviest being uh, recorded was 5.2 grams and uh, a female is slightly larger at four grams and their heaviest is 6.1 grams. Um, but still, we're talking grams. So, you know, if you can imagine holding a penny in the palm of your hand, uh, you know, they weigh next to nothing. But with that, they can, they still can, uh, they still can consume up to 40% of their body weight during migration to uh, to make that flight, which is pretty fantastic. They also lose much of their body mass crossing, you know, they're crossing over water over the Gulf Coast uh, or over the, the uh, Gulf of Mexico. So they're, they're losing a lot of body mass, just burning energy. Um, now, uh, I said the females are slightly larger and they don't have that red gorget. Um, the, uh, the, the gorget is um, a courtship display. It, again, uh, kind of typically with sexually dimorphic birds, uh, there are uh, the males tend to be the more flamboyant, the bright, the brightly colored ones. If you think about male cardinals, they're bright red, and females are kind of that pinkish, you know, uh, taupe color, um, that brownish color. Uh, but their courtship is pretty fascinating. The males. Uh, once they reach their breeding grounds after migration, once they reach their breeding grounds and uh, have have a second to um, have a second recoup from that um, over you know over sea and over land journey that they took, um, the uh, the males will uh, attract a female and do a series uh, in order to uh, attract her and try to entice her into becoming a mate. Will do a series of these sweeping U-shaped flights up to uh, 50 feet. They'll they'll do these huge U-shaped uh, flights, and the whole time you can hear the humming of their wings and these kind of high-pitched screeching vocalizations that the male is emanating. Um, and if uh, they they'll do several of these and then take a break and just keep doing them, and if, should the female choose. To mate with the male, uh, mating happens midair, and it's very quick. And after that, uh, <clears throat> the male and the female—they're not—they're um, not quite as involved with one another um, as much as uh, as uh, some other birds. Now, the female will lay a pea-sized or two pea-sized eggs. Very rarely three. A lot of a lot of. Uh, nests that have been recorded that might have three eggs often all three young perish because the female just cannot uh cannot continue to feed and provide nutrition for the young um so generally it's one or two eggs most often two of these p-shaped eggs with a with a, with a pretty surprisingly short gestation period um 14 to 16 days with 21 days kind of being the uh, cold weather maximum if they're in a cold uh, temperate you know over overcast climate uh, 21 days is sort of the maximum time of gestation and when the young hatch they're two centimeters long so imagine a, a, a bumblebee or a mason bee in your yard you know uh, two centimeters long not very big and they're entirely reliant on the um, on the parent bird, on the female, for nutrition. They're uh, they've got shorter bills. They have downy uh, feathers, very little protection. And the female uh, during that brooding period, when the female is um, when the female is 
hatching the eggs, when the eggs are getting ready to hatch, she'll spend 50 to 55 minutes of every hour on the egg with, with only five, you know, five or 10 minutes foraging to come back um, just to keep her energy up. And then after they hatch, she still has to, uh, she still broods them for quite some time because again, they're, they're just kind of covered down. They're not very well protected. And she is feeding them as a combination of nectar that she has uh, collected and kept in her crop and uh, small insects like aphids and small ants and things um, like that. Uh, now, the, uh, let's see. Um, now their population trend kind of in part to, uh, in part because of feeding, uh, people hummingbird feeding in their yard and the sort of uh, pollinator garden movement uh, in certain locales now uh, because of less than sustainable farming practices in Central America and South America their population is in danger there but here in North America in many areas their populated the, the population trend is increased because they uh, because so many people are feeding and so many people are uh, conscious about what they're um, planting in their yard for these um, birds to eat. So it's kind of interesting. We, we uh, hopefully we um, are helping the hummingbird population pretty dramatically uh, with with our backyard feeding. Um, so that said, um, there are uh, and, and there are predators to uh, hummingbirds in spite of them moving very fast, actually um, several years ago there was kind of a viral YouTube video of a praying mantis trying to catch hummingbirds. Um, but many other things uh, prey on hummingbirds. If you can, if you can imagine, cats are a huge problem. With almost all, almost all of our songbirds catch cats uh, are a huge threat here. Um, but things like that. Uh, also, weather is a major problem. Uh, oftentimes because of when they lay their eggs, um, wind storms and cold weather will often uh, require the female to rebuild a nest and sometimes double brood, which is, uh, which is hard on the female. That affects, that affects a lot of things because she's devoted all this energy to, uh, to a nest and to eggs. So she's burning extra calories, double brooding. Uh, so a lot of different things can kind of uh, limit the uh, populations of hummingbirds. Now, um, if we take a look at in this on the screen here, there's a uh, picture of a skeletal hummingbird, and uh, you'll notice you can actually see through its its uh, its breastbone there. They're they're incredibly delicate, like uh, like all birds, their bones are hollow. But I mean, you're talking about something that weighs less than a penny, so they're incredibly delicate um, and incredibly light. Uh, and I picked this picture of a, of a hummingbird skeleton because you can see that tongue. One of their unique adaptations, uh, which I think Kalen will cover in the feeding uh, portion, but one of their unique adaptations is this long uh, forked tongue for uh, collecting that nectar that they're um, that they're drinking uh, and feeding on. Um, and as I said, you know, they do, they primarily feed on nectar, but they will collect uh, ants and aphids and small insects uh, as, a, uh, as a protein source. Um, so let's see. Now, uh, I've also included a picture, an example of hummingbird, um, <laughs> of hummingbird excretions up in the right, upper right hand corner of this slide here. Um, my experience is you most often will, uh, if you're close to your hummingbird feeder or hand feeding hummingbirds at Lake Hope, uh, chances are you're going to get splattered with um, just kind of a, a clear liquid. And that's, uh, that's just, um, that's hummingbird pee. Uh, you you uh, can take a, take a look here. That's the uh, hummingbird's cloaca there. And there's also an example of hummingbird poop. So very, very small. A uh, very small critter, um, but just like all other birds, they do excrete, and you can often watch them. Um, and as they're flying, you'll see this sort of mist uh, right underneath them. And it's uh, I only I only included that because it was always novel for me to for me to watch when I was when I was working at Lake Hope. Um, 
So with that, can I go ahead and get off this screen, Alyssa? Is that all right? Um, yeah, uh, did yeah, yeah. Did 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 Kaylin, um, Kaylin, uh, or, um or, let me see. Uh, oh, everybody's still there. Can you see me all right? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I kept getting notifications on my computer. So, uh, Kaylin, do you want to, would you like to start and then we can, um, is that our, can we, can we go to Kaylin and then we'll. Uh, yeah, we can go to Kaylin and then answer some questions at the end. Um, quite a few people are asking about how to attract a garden for hummingbirds. So, might be it. Um, I know, Kaylin, you have some stuff on that. Yeah, let me bring up my PowerPoint here and answer some of those questions, hopefully. All right, can everybody see it? I'm sending it live in just a second. Okay. There we Well, looks like it's loading. There we go. All right. So thank you, John, for all that great information. I love hummingbirds. I think a lot of us that are watching this webinar are here because we love them too. Um, and you did mention that the population trends are increasing for ruby-threaded hummingbirds just because we're being more conscious about um, what we're planting in our gardens and um, trying to attract wildlife in general. So this particular um, PowerPoint is going to be focused more for hummingbirds. There's a couple different things you can do just to uh, help attract those specific species to your, your yard. So we're going to be talking about why we garden for hummingbirds, um, the specific, specific needs of hummingbirds, native versus non-native plant species, uh, and then I'll give you a couple ideas to get started and the French benefits of not just uh, gardening for hummingbirds, but what else you'll be attracting and helping out. So why do we garden for hummingbirds? Well, uh, as John mentioned, there is some issues in their wintering grounds in Central and South America. Yes, they fly all the way down there, 2,000 miles plus, um, with agricultural demands down there, um, deforestation. Uh, but also we have those issues up here too. And as you can see in the pictures to the left, uh, it's really boring. There's not a lot of fun food for them um, or water or places to hide. So urbanization of the landscape uh, is an issue as well as those agricultural demands that um, we're placing on, on the landscape. The other reason why you should garden for hummingbirds is because just like me, I hope you think they're beautiful and they're really fun to watch. And if you keep your eyes peeled on the hummingbird feeder behind me, you might see some. Um, a lot of people have special memories associated with them. Certainly um, on a normal summer, uh, Thursday, Saturday or Sunday in the afternoon, you would be able to make a memory at Lake Hope State Park by hand feeding them. It's a different summer this year though, so hopefully next year we'll be able to hand feed the hummingbirds again. There's also a lot of spiritual, cultural, and historical importances too. Um, as John mentioned, they're only found in the Western Hemisphere. So a lot of the, the native peoples in uh, North America, Central, South America had cultural importances um, connected to the hummingbirds. For example, the Aztecs thought that they were warriors that protected the peoples from the dark. And that gorget that he mentioned that was so bright in the sunlight, so striking, um, was them holding the sun or the warmth in to help protect. So there is a lot of, uh, a lot of connections uh, in the Western Hemisphere as far as cultural and spiritual importances go. And um, I also added just a fun little uh, quote down here at the bottom. No other bird has captured the imagination of mankind as completely as the hummingbird. And that was by the artist and designer Don Balk. He uh, designed the 1992 US postage stamp collection and had hummingbirds on them. So I think he, he captured their essence uh, very well with that quote. 
So what are the specific needs for hummingbirds? <clears throat> John mentioned they're nectar eaters. Uh, they also need protein from insects. So we're talking little teeny, teeny, tiny things. Um, they're not gonna go eat a honeybee or something, just small little almost micro um, protein out there in the flowers that they're going to be uh, nectaring on as well. So you need the food. You also need a water source. Like other birds, um, you could provide a bird bath. However, because of the minute size of the hummingbird, you don't want to have a regular um, water dish out there. And if you do, only fill it to about a quarter to a half an inch. They need a very, very shallow water to be able to bathe in. And honestly, they really don't drink the water. It is pretty much strictly for bathing just because they're uh, nectaring so often and that's a pretty high water content. So you could have a dish. Um, I have a, a rock that kind of has a depression. So each night I kind of spray the rock down and it holds some water for the next day. Hey, Kaylin, I'm going to enlarge your video screen because there is a hummingbird back there and I want be people to be able to see okay. it. Oh, yeah. And they may have just flown away, but I'm going to keep it on you for just a second if you want to sure. keep talking and I'll go back to your PowerPoint in a minute. Yeah, they may come back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so so you could do you could do a dish or a, an indent. Um, you could certainly put up a mist fountain or a dripper. The movement itself is going to attract the birds to it and because it's just little bits of water moving or misting, um, they're going to be able to utilize that too. Naturally, they would use uh, dew collected on leaves. They may fly through a plant or land on it briefly and move that water through their feathers to kind of preen themselves and clean themselves off. <clears throat> so water is something that you want to keep in mind when you're gardening for hummingbirds. The next thing is shelter. Just like other birds, they need um, protection from predators, as John mentioned before. Uh, but they also need perches to digest. They're digesting way more often than they're feeding. So they're just sitting there um, letting it digest whatever they've snacked on. Uh, so they need something where it's protected and they can, they can hide there to do that. The other thing is uh, they're very, very territorial. If you have a hummingbird feeder at your house, you probably already know this, uh, but males and females both are very territorial with um, the feeders and the food sources in the area. So they like to perch somewhere and survey that territory uh, and then swoop down and, and fend off anybody that is coming into their area. So make sure you provide some sort of perch for them. What I recommend as far as that is concerned is um, some shrub or tree that is a little bit more open, um, not really dense like a pine or uh, spruce, something like, well, I have, for example, um, some shrubby St. John's wort. It's a, a sort of a light and airy shrub, smaller leaves so they can get in and out of that really quickly. Uh, the last thing that you need to provide for them is a place to raise their young. And they're going to nest on woody vegetation, so mainly trees. I haven't really found a, a particular species of tree that they prefer over another. Um, I do know that they've nested in white oak, uh, sycamore, maples, um, and then we do also have some pine here across the road that I've seen them go in and out enough that I think they're probably nesting in there too. But uh, they're going to nest anywhere from 10 to 30 or so feet up in the air. And particularly what they're looking for is a downward sloping branch that is covered by a branch above it. Uh, so you have some protection from the weather, but you also have a little bit of camouflage. And uh, they're going to put that nest on that branch um, so that they can get in and out quickly as well. So make sure you provide some sort of woody vegetation that's that's high enough, tall enough, at least 10 feet, so that they, they can nest in the area. Now as far as nesting materials are concerned, 
Um, they actually do use mostly downy plant fibers. So if you think about, they don't necessarily use this, but as an image for you, um, everybody has seen the dandelion seeds, that tuft that helps it blow through the air, something light and airy like that they like to collect, um, or a milkweed seed pod, the, the seed tufts to help them move through the air. They need that nesting material um, to help build the core of the nest. And then also they're gonna stick lichen on the outside of it. And lichen is a symbiotic relationship between algae and fungi. Um, it generally is a gray, blue, or green, and it sticks to trees and it sticks to rocks. And it looks sometimes like little blue or green cornflake pieces. And they'll, they'll pick those pieces and they'll stick them on the, um, the nest so that it helps to camouflage it and keep it a little more waterproof. So if you have lichen in the area on your trees or rocks um, or want to promote that growth, um, that would be something helpful for the hummingbirds as well. And then the last thing that they do uh, use in their nesting uh, materials is they use spider webs or cobwebs. They'll use that to glue the nest or stick the nest to the, the branch. Um, so it's a very stretchy material. It's very strong and waterproof. So as the babies increase in size, that nest will sort of increase with them a little bit. So if you have cobwebs, you have my permission to not clean them from your deck or from your patio or anywhere like that because potentially those cobwebs and spider webs could be used for nesting material for the hummingbirds. So it's okay to, to be a little um, less clean, if you will. So getting started um, gardening for hummingbirds, first you wanna do a, a quick survey of what you already have in the area. And when I say area, I mean it can be a small area as you see behind me, right along the edge of my uh, garage is generally where most of my flowering plants are at. Uh, and that's where two of my feeders are at as well. So we're only talking a, probably a 40 foot stretch or so. Um, or if you wanna devote your whole garden, your whole uh, lot to hummingbirds, that's fine too. But make sure that you're looking at what hummer friendly features you already have. If you already have a water feature that is suitable, keep it. If you already have um, open shrubs that are good for perching and territory survey for them, keep it. If you already have red tubular shaped flowers, you can keep those. Make sure you work around what you have. Um, then what you wanna do is map your backyard for the soil and sunlight conditions so that you know what you're, what you're working with and then what plants you can add to that so that there's less maintenance on your end. So is that area dry and full sun? Is it moist or wet and shady? These are things you wanna look at when uh, you decide what you wanna do as far as gardening. And keep in mind that that sunlight and the uh, moisture level may change throughout the year in the summertime, you might have more sun because the sun is a little further north in the sky, um, as opposed to earlier in the spring when the hummingbirds are arriving or as they're leaving later in the summer and the fall. So just keep an eye on it year round. The next thing that you wanna do is make sure you're choosing native trees and shrubs first. Um, we'll talk a little bit about native versus non-native here in a minute. And what you want to do, why you want to do those first is because if you plant trees and shrubs, eventually that could change the sunlight or the soil conditions. So you plant a nice big red bud, for example, and then instead of full sun underneath of it, it ends up being part sun or shade. So keep those in mind. Once the, the plant grows to its maturity, what is that going to look like around it? Um, and then also make sure you're choosing plants that are going to provide the resources for the hummingbirds throughout the season they're going to be here. Um, so John mentioned that they arrive usually in mid-April here in the central Ohio area. 
If you're a little farther south, they'll show up a little sooner. And if you're a little farther north, they're going to show up a little bit later, but generally speaking, April through October at the latest is usually um, when we see hummingbirds here in Ohio. All right, so native versus non-native plants. I want you guys to think native, 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 because that is what is going to bring the greatest benefit, not only to hummingbirds, but all the other wildlife. Um, and we'll talk about why that's important here in a minute as well. But the, the main reason is they're easier to take care of. They are adapted for the conditions in your area, so they require less maintenance. Uh, I am a fairly lazy gardener. I can hardly keep succulents alive in my house. So take it from me that if you plant natives in the right sunlight and soil conditions, uh, you will not have to do anything probably ever again. Uh, as you can see behind me, uh, I have some native species. <clears throat> I watered them the first year and then I just leave them alone. So that is great on my end. <laughs> So the other thing, uh, th the other reason why you want to plant natives is because it maintains the natural diversity of the area. And generally you want as much diversity as you can. Biodiversity is what it's called. So you want as many different kinds of plants and animals as you can in the area because that is what uh, maintains a healthy status for the environment. Make sure you're providing the best quality of resources for wildlife. Um, so that means that the, the wildlife or particularly the, the hummingbirds that we're talking about today, um, that's going to be the best source of food for them. So you can plant non-natives, that's fine, but it may not give them exactly what they're looking for. So instead of a chicken breast, it's like eating a chicken nugget. You would rather have the chicken breast because it's a, a, a little more healthy. <clears throat> so as far as uh, exotic plants or non-native species go, if you have an invasive species, that can outcompete natives. So uh, many people, when it comes to invasive species, think about garlic mustard, for example. In the springtime, uh, it is an invasive non-native species of plant that blooms a small white flower it can outcompete a lot of the other plants that are supposed to be there in the area and just sort of take over the whole landscape. And so then you have a monoculture. You only have one plant there. So that's not providing the best uh, resources for the wildlife in the area. Um, as I said with the native species of plants, uh, they're not adapted to local conditions typically, so they may need more water or they may need more um, pruning or fertilizer or something like that. So they're going to require more maintenance. And then, as indicated again b before, um, they're not going to give those quality resources to our hummingbirds that we want. Now, the pictures to the right, you can see wild blue phlox. That's a native species that blooms in the springtime compared to Dame's Rocket. You can really, um, if, if you look, you can find very comparable uh, native flowers to the non-native species uh, as far as looks are concerned. So if you are looking for a particular color, like if you're looking for red or oranges with the hummingbirds, you can find those native species and you don't have to rely on uh, the, the non-natives um, to make your garden look beautiful. So as far as flowers to plant uh, native species to Ohio, I have six different varieties um, that are kind of in the, the, the top ranking, most favorite hummingbird uh, nectar resources. So first of all, in your mind, when you go to the garden center, I want you to think a red funnel, a red funnel. That is the shape. Uh, and the color that they're going to be most attracted to. So as John was talking about the body of the hummingbird, they have that long skinny bill and he mentioned that they also have that forked tongue that's really long as well. 
that forked tongue and long bill are going to help that bird feed further back into a flower to the point where other uh, insects or other birds for that matter aren't going to be able to feed there. So that nectar will be saved for the ones that can reach it, which would be the hummingbirds. So if you have that funnel shape, that's what they're really going to benefit from. Um, there are some long-tongued bees or maybe some butterflies that will be able to get the nectar, but there is less competition um, with those longer tubular shaped flowers. The red color um, comes from the fact that the, the hummingbirds can see in regular and ultraviolet light, uh, and a lot of insects can only see in ultraviolet. So as the insects are looking at their landscape, flowers in the ultraviolet like spectrum are going to indicate to them with certain colors and patterns that there's something yummy in here and they're going to go to those flowers. Oftentimes they're white or yellow colored to us as we can see them, um, but the, the hummingbirds are going to be attracted to red because <clears throat> the insects are going to pass over those more often, the red colored ones, um, because they uh, are not giving that indication in the ultraviolet light -like spectrum that there is something delicious inside. Um, so the hummingbirds have learned this and have um, benefited from it, of course, by eating the nectar that is reserved in these flowers um, that the, the bees may not even know that are there. So the first one that we're talking about is wild columbine. That's in the upper left hand corner. It almost looks like a shooting star or a comet if you've been watching the night sky recently. Uh, this is a, a really great one to have in your garden because it's an early bloomer. So we're going to see this probably as the hummingbirds are arriving in April, maybe early May, depending on where you're at in Ohio. So this is a, like I said, you want to have those resources through the whole season that they're here. So this is a nice early one that they can feed off of. The bee balm or Oswego tea is the next one in the upper right hand corner. Uh, I actually have some behind me, although it's it's kind of on its way out. So it's a midsummer bloomer. The thing to keep in mind with uh, the bee balm is that it is in the mint family. And if you are familiar with the mint family in a garden, they're pretty aggressive growers and they can spread very rapidly from season to season. So keep in mind if you have something like the bee balm or um, even the, the close relative, the monarda, um, that is uh, sort of that purpley lavender color that you see along the roadway, um, that put it in a spot where you want to let it take over or you're going to be manually pulling it up each summer or each uh, spring. So that one will spread pretty rapidly. Oh, the last one down here at the bottom is a, a really fun one. It's blooming right now, actually. It's the spotted jewelweed or touch me not. The reason why it's called touch me not is uh, because the seed pods, when they're ripe and full of the seed, if you touch them or squeeze them just a little bit, it pops open and the seed springs forward. So you, you don't want to touch them if you don't want to spread the seed. Um, this one likes wet soils. It likes a lot of shade, so oftentimes you'll see it down in a floodplain area. I have quite a bit of it um, kind of at the edge of my yard since there's a, a small creek that runs through part of my property, so there's quite a bit of it down there. Um, the spotted jewelweed is a little bit different in color. It's this orange one that you can see. There is another one that is a yellow. Um, that's a, the, the Palita variety. It's uh, not quite going to attract the hummingbirds like the spotted one is. So if you have a choice between the two, go with the spotted. Um, an added benefit of this one is if you happen to get poison ivy, you can actually break the stem and the sap or the juice on the inside um, is a good remedy to uh, neutralize the poison ivy toxins on your skin. So not just hummingbirds love that one.
the next three here, uh, cardinal flower in the upper left hand corner. This is one that also enjoys wet soils. Uh, it also likes fairly shady areas. Uh, if you are familiar with vernal pools, oftentimes you'll see them along the edges or where that vernal, vernal pool was in the summertime. Um, just pops of that bright red color and otherwise green forest. So that's a really fun one to have. It does reseed itself fairly readily. So once you get a couple plants in the ground, um, it shouldn't take all that long for it to build a small colony. The next one in the upper right hand corner is Royal Catchfly. Another really beautiful bright red color. Notice again the tubular shaped flowers. Uh, this one likes an open prairie habitat, so full sun, um, and it is also considered a threatened species in Ohio. So if you decide to plant this in your garden, in your yard, you're actually doing not only the hummingbirds uh, a good thing, but you're also helping the species increase in numbers here in our state. Uh, hummingbirds are considered one of the only handful, maybe even the only um, pollinator for this particular plant species. So if you have the right conditions for Royal Catchfly, I really encourage you to try and grow that one. And last in our top six is the Trumpet Creeper or Trumpet Vine. Uh, this is a really robust, very aggressive um, vine. Um, oftentimes you'll see it growing right along the roadway, so I don't think it really minds disturbed habitats or disturbed soils. Um, typically full sun, maybe part shade, uh, and it is going to get really big. Uh, it's not a problem for it to grow 30 feet into the air if you trellis it or you have it on the side of a building. Um, so if you want to take up a lot of vertical space, or if you want to trellis it horizontally over like a, uh, some sort of, oh, what do you call it? Like a gazebo area, um, this would be the plant that I would choose. Um, it also is a great long time bloomer. So it, I think it started blooming in the last probably week or two and it can continue in through September blooming. So you get that later end of the season um, nectar source as well. So those are the top six that I would recommend uh, native species that you can plant in your garden. Other considerations for gardening for hummingbirds is of course feeders. So you want to think about the placement of your feeders. I recommend that your um, hummingbird feeders that, that you have at least two you can have one, that's fine, but remember they're really territorial, so one bird is going to guard that feeder um, and may not let anybody else feed from it. So I recommend at least two feeders, space them out at least 10 feet apart from each other and not within eyesight of each other so that they can't, one bird can't guard both feeders at the same time. So give everybody else a chance to feed. And then as John uh, said earlier, there are predators such as feral cats um, and praying mantis. You want to keep those feeders out of reach of predators. So make sure they're at least four feet off the ground and they're not touching any vegetation around them so that anything can crawl onto the feeder uh, and await the hummers to come to them. Another thing when you're thinking about gardening for wildlife in particular is avoiding chemical use. If you plant natives, the maintenance is going to be really low and you won't have to probably use anything on them. Um, weeds are not a problem. You can have weeds and everything still looks beautiful. Um, just keep in mind that if you do use chemicals, make sure you're reading the package and using it appropriately and using a minimal amount. Uh, but it is best to avoid them entirely. And then as you're gardening and maintaining the garden, make sure that you're caring for the plants so that you're encouraging reblooming. So you might have to prune them back at certain times or deadhead your flowers so that you have a continual 
um, amount of blooms throughout the growing season. So just keep in mind on how to maintain that bloom time um, for the longevity of the season. All right, so your yard is very important. Even if you have a little teeny tiny space that you want to garden for hummingbirds, that's great. That is going to help increase um, the resources and increase the number of hummingbirds in your area. Um, even if you have that small space as opposed to something bigger, it's going to help increase the biodiversity. And uh, as of 2019, I just wanted to add this particular data point in here. A total of 384 species last year were anywhere from extirpated, which means they're not extinct, but you can't find them in Ohio anymore. Anywhere from extirpated to extinct or to species of special interest. So you go extirpate, extinct, extirpated, uh, endangered, species of concern, threatened, and then special interest. So in that range, there was 384 species. Birds, mammals, insects, mollusks. Um, so increasing the habitat for them is one thing, really small thing that we can do to help um, decrease that number and increase the biodiversity. And the last thing, of course, and thank you for being here today, is to spread the news and make sure everybody is um, in the know as far as gardening and feeding hummingbirds. I do, as I segue into feeding the birds, want to show you this little clip of um, a video that one of my volunteers, Tiffany, did last year when we were hand feeding the hummingbirds. If I can find my mouse here. Oh, there we go. Just to see that tongue kind of slurping up that nectar. So it is forked. The tongue is forked at the end. That helps to grab insects that are in uh, the in the flower itself. And also, there's lots of little ridges that fill via capillary action, um, almost like a zipper tongue. It unzips as it goes in, and it closes back up as it um, goes back into their mouth. So they're sort of lapping up like a dog as opposed to slurping up through a straw so in and out in and out in and out and that's a female so you can see that white throat no red gorget there and a little a little bit of sound at the end if i had my sound on but i don't think i turned that on so all right now i'm going to discuss um, how to feed them with the feeders, not with our um, our gardening. So I already talked about placement. Um, you have a couple options as far as feeders are concerned. You have the disc shape, which is flat. Uh, lots of holes on this one. It doesn't hold quite as much nectar or that sure the the sugar solution in the bottom so we don't use this one at lake hope but this is an option for you if you want it at your home there is a reservoir in the center that you can fill with water uh, as an ant moat so if you have ant problems try and look for something like that or something like this where you can fill with water and then put it on the top of your container like this so the ants crawl in this way and can't cross that moat to get to your sugar water. Uh, this one is the kind that we do use at Lake Hope. This is a reservoir feeder. So you have the sugar solution here and they feed from around, um, around the bottom. What I look for in hummingbird feeders is a really wide lip, so something very easy to clean. So this is nice and wide. I can really get a bottle brush down in there well. And then the base of this opens so that I can um, scrub all of that sitting sugar solution out. 
what you want to avoid is all of that sugar fermenting and molding. So if you see something like a stuff floating in there or it's cloudy or you see black mold, that's something that you're going to want to avoid. So when you uh, clean out your feeders, all I do is use hot water, scrub it really good, and if there's something really sticking, um, you can do a little bit of vinegar, just a light vinegar solution, and help to clean that out and really scrub it. Don't use bleach. Um, it's not necessary, and try to avoid uh, using soap too, although if you rinse it out really well, that's okay. But hot water is usually going to do the trick. Um, as far as the solution is concerned, what you want to do is use a one part sugar, so the white sugar, just regular table sugar, to four parts water. So one part sugar to four parts water. Uh, and you can make a whole big bulk uh, amount of that and keep it in your fridge for about 10 days or so and use that as you're refilling your feeders. Now, as far as cleaning schedule is concerned, just really quick, because I know we're getting crunched on time here. I'm going to share this. Oops. Little chart here to show you guys as far as how often to clean them during what temperature. Can you see it? Yeah. yeah. So right now, since we've had 90 plus degrees during the daytime temperatures, you should be cleaning out your feeders um, almost every day. And that's going to help the, that sugar solution from fermenting and molding in there. So make sure you, you are uh, cleaning it regularly. And if they're not draining the solution within that time period, um, just don't fill it up as much. And that will help um, you from wasting it. So once it gets cooler back down into the 70s, you can leave it out for more uh, more days at a time without having to clean it. And if you do go on vacation or you're away or can't clean your feeders um, as readily as they need to be, just take them down uh, and they'll find something else to feed on. They'll probably disappear for a little while, um, but that's OK. It's better than them feeding on the, the fermented moldy stuff. Oh, all right. Well, that's my little blurb. I'm sure we have some questions. <laughs> um, well, we are almost at, at the end of our time here, so um, I do, do want to ask, did you touch did you on, touch on uh, food coloring, coloring in, in the... Oh, in yeah, so um, don't put food coloring in your, your sugar solution. Uh, it is not necessary, and most feeders have red on them to attract them anyway, so you don't have to use any food coloring. Okay. And it's cheaper to make it yourself than buy it, so just go ahead and make it. Just boil the water and add the sugar and you're done. Four to one? Yep, one part sugar to four parts water. And it, it should be the white table sugar. Don't use honey. Don't use brown sugar, don't use stevia. Nothing is going to mimic the fructose and sucrose in the, the natural nectar like the white sugar will. OK, okay. Um, like I said, we're getting close, close to time. So unless you have anything else, Kaylin or John or Donna, um, I think we'll wrap it up. Are you guys good? Yeah. OK. Um, well, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, as a reminder, um, next week we have cavity nesting birds that we'll talk about. Um, and if you want to join us for our Wetland Wonders webinar series with our friends from Old Woman Creek National Estuary and Research Reserve, those um, we have two more webinars left with them. Tomorrow, uh, so Thursdays at noon, uh, tomorrow we're going to be talking about citizen science and how you can get involved in helping um, your state and your environment through citizen science. And um, yeah, we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us. Thanks to our presenters too. Thank you.